Yeah, uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, it's my proud uh, privilege to uh, share my knowledge on uh, NAFLD and diabetes and overlooked complication, uh, diagnosis, uh, and emerging treatment. So, uh, I can't control from here. Can okay, okay. Yeah. So uh, basically, uh, NFLD is very common uh, world over, and since when there is an increase uh, in the prevalence of diabetes uh, and uh, obesity, uh, there is more. Uh, so you know, NFLD is there, and uh, like uh, overall, around 15 to 20 percent. But in India, it's around uh, 25 to 30 percent in adult population. And NFLD, which is taken as a marker or a risk factor for chronic liver disease. More than that, it is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So this point has to be understood well. Once we diagnose NAFLD, it is not only chronic liver disease, it is more than that cardiovascular disease as well as CKD. Now, we can see uh, in this slide that they're almost, uh, you know, uh, in observational studies, uh, uh, and uh, overall prevalence if we see in some population, in diabetic population, up to the tune of 50%, and maybe more than that, around 70%. While uh, in 19 observational studies, the lower one we can see, uh, there is almost, you know, 30% uh, you know, patients who have diabetes have NAFLD and vice versa. Patients who have NAFLD, the more severe the disease, more are the chances of having diabetes. So these are four criteria which we have to, you know, understand. One is, uh, you know, uh, hepatic steatosis, and then is absence of uh, significant intake of alcohol, absence of compelling etiologies of hepatic steatosis, other, you know, uh, diseases, and then coexisting chronic liver disease like viral hepatitis and other causes. So these four criteria we have to meet before we diagnose. And this is the spectrum and pathogenesis, uh, you know, of uh, NAFLD. And here we can see it's a, it's a multiple hit theory. So the first hit theory is whenever there is an increased intake of calorie-dense diet, there is, uh, you know, more storage of fat uh, in the fat cells. And it is not only, you know, a normal fat, it is abnormal fat. And there's increase in the size of fat cells, adipocytes, release of free fatty acids, which are taken up by liver, and there's increased intake of this triglycerides in the liver. So <clears throat> abnormal accumulation of abnormal cells in liver is basically leading to NAFLD. If this continues, then there is a changes in the liver enzymes, and there are other features of, because it is a part of metabolic syndrome, NAFLD. So they are, you know, basically dyslipidemia, hypertension, and other uh, abnormalities. So ultimately, this goes on, and there are multiple hits, multiple injuries to liver, and there is, you know, uh, signs of then portal hypertension, cirrhosis, and then ultimately some patients develop hepatic hepatocellular carcinoma. So that's how we can see, you know, we can see some patients, you know, initial stages of steatosis leading to steatohepatitis, which is NASH, leading to cirrhosis, and then hepatocellular carcinoma. So one important point we have to again remember NAFLD, which is reversible, totally reversible in the initial stages, we can avoid not only cardiovascular disease, CKD, as well as hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, other important point which we have to understand is there is a complex relationship whenever there is, you know, lipotoxicity, as uh, Dr. Uh, uh, the first speaker uh, mentioned, uh, there is uh, abnormal, uh, you know, release of free fatty acids in the blood and which are taken up by uh, the beta cells uh, leading to toxicity of beta cells as well as liver. So abnormal accumulation in amount as well as quality. So quantity and quality of fat matters uh, leading to stasosis, leading to inflammation, necrosis, and fibrosis. Now this is another theory which is a twin cycle theory that whenever there's a release of free fatty acids in the blood, it is taken up by not only the liver and uh, you know, other cells, but by the pancreas, and even one gram of this fat inside the pancreas lead to 
toxicity in the beta cells leading to deficiency of insulin as well as insulin resistance. So this free fatty acid, they not only lead to insulin resistance but also lead to insulin deficiency by directly suppressing beta cells. And other is on other hand, you know, so this is pancreas, on other hand, when these free fatty acids are taken up by the liver, then there is basically an increase in the fat in the liver, leading to suppression of the normal processes, more glucose uptake, more glucose glycogenesis, and more release of glucose. So hepatic glucose output also increases. So to, on two hands, you know, one hand, there is a suppression of beta cells, toxicity to beta cells, decrease insulin, and on the other hand, liver toxicity, increase, uh, you know, free fatty acids by the liver, increase glucose, toxicity. So, you know, parallel both the things are going on and which is very, very important. So basically there is a complex interaction going on between adipose tissue, muscles and liver. These three things and ultimately this has an impact on cardiovascular system. And not only, you know, it is, it is uh, you know, leads to a lipotoxicity, there is inflammation, more, you know, uh, you know uh, 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 release of uh, uh, oxidative, uh, you know, oxidants or inflammatory cytokines, as well as this increased procoagulant state. All this lead to ultimately increased atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. So this uh, slide is again very important, NAFLD and diabetes. Again, there's a very, very close relationship. Uh, you, know, uh, s uh, you know, once there's increase in free fatty acid in the blood, which are taken up by uh, the pancreas, insulin deficiency, and are again taken up by even the liver. So ultimately, this NAFLD and diabetes, they have a hand-in-hand, -hand, you know, you know uh, a relationship, and they mutually increase each other. So if a patient is having diabetes, there are more chances of having NAFLD, and vice versa, if a patient has NAFLD, there is a very high risk of developing diabetes. And these are different mechanisms which lead to, uh, you know, uh, complications uh, in NFLD, like decreased adiponectin, and there is lipotoxicity, decrease, you know, IRS, mitochondrial dysfunction, adipose tissue uh, dysfunction. You know, whenever we in have an uh, increase in weight, there is increase in lipogenesis, that time also. But that is only increase in the s number of adipocytes, not the size. When we take calorie-dense diet, then there's increase in the size of the adipocytes also simultaneously along with the number. And this increase in size of adipocyte leads to inflammation and release of adipocytokines. Now these are again different mechanisms leading to cardiovascular disease. One is systemic insulin resistance, endothelial dysfunction, altered lipid metabolism, systemic inflammation, plaque instability, PAI1 also increases and oxidative stress. So multiple things are going on. It's not one. And that means, you know, we have to have a multifactorial approach, lifestyle along with, you know, treating NAFLD and other, all other cardiovascular risk factors. There are, you know, there are, again, there's a relationship, you know, between uh, NAFLD and atherosclerosis. And uh, there is uh, atherogenic uh, dyslipidemia. Whenever there's insulin resistance, we all know there's increase in TG. Uh, increase in small dense LDL as well as a decreased HDL. That's how, you know, there are so many complications, the cardiovascular, not only coronary artery disease. We, we limit our knowledge to, you know, heart problem or it's CAD. No, there are many more things. One is, uh, you know, heart failure, which is coming up in a big, big way. Uh, you know, have PEF. Uh, so patients may be, you know, appearing normal and after three to five years of uh, diabetes, uh, almost, uh, you know, 40% uh, of them can have, have PEF. Then cardiac dysfunction, cardiac hypertrophy, then aortic valve stenosis, and then annulation, uh, calcification, atrial fibrillation. It's very common, you know, in patients who have insulin resistance, NAFLD, and QTC prolongation. So that point, again, we have to understand. Diabetic patients, and if they have CVD, there is already increased QTC, and if we add medications which lead to further increase in QTC, like, you know, azithromycin was given left, right, center, uh, in COVID, that's wrong. So we have to see to it, patient is already having a risk of increased QTC, don't give, use such medications. So diagnosis uh, is basically on clinical, uh, you know, parameters and then, uh, you know, imaging and then biomarkers, I will be taking one by one. FIB4 score is the most important. And this, you know, basically, uh, you know, uh, if it is uh, less than 1.3, it is um, low uh, probability 
uh, and then if it is uh, intermediate is 1.3 to 2.67 and uh, more than 2.67 is severe and this depends on four parameters age of the patient EST like SGOT, SGPT and platelet so four things you have to know there is a formula given here and calculate the risk once you find out this you can always intensify and accordingly you know you can uh, tell the prognosis and treat accordingly now there are other uh, models also you know one is the model of end stage liver disease that's all, that's again a you know calculation of the risk factor and then apri apri is very important you know i will this is you know uh, basically um, uh, ast platelet uh, 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 say ratio index so here what you have to take is just sgot uh, the patient's value upper limit of sgot over the platelet count of the patient into 100 it's very easy you don't need to go for ultrasound not everybody can afford ultrasound so only as a uh, cbc you know complete uh, say count uh, including platelets and sgot and you can find out you know apri and once apri is more than one uh, it is it is a risk for uh, nafld so this is you know a one test which is which can be done very easily and then there are you know multiple other tests besides ultrasound uh, ultrasound is a very small test you know not very uh, significant but we have uh say uh, this uh, magnetic resonance elastography is the is the one of the best and then it can be you know but the cost is too much then nafld versus mafld now in times to come take my words today we are talking of nafld nafld i think tomorrow onwards or in couple of months we would be talking mafld metabolic dysfunction associated liver disease today everybody says liver biopsies and you know other things to diagnose uh, and uh, uh, like you know mri but but it should be clinical and you know we i will tell you how you know uh, we we find uh, you know uh, mafld so mafld is basically you know uh, hepatic stenosis with some blood markers like liver function test and any of the following maybe diabetes maybe obesity and any of the metabolic features metabolic syndrome you must be knowing central obesity triglycerides hdl fasting plasma glucose levels so these are you know certain uh, parameters so either you know say on ultrasound there is some grade 1 or 2 and you may not go for fibro scan hgot is little high then presence of diabetes itself makes it mafld or obesity or any of the two of the five parameters of metabolic syndrome any two so once it's there that's how you know in times to come because ultimately the treatment has to start so why we depend on fibro scan and other things so you know ultimately mafld would be uh, you know ultimately the diagnosis and that's how you know if i've already told you about this uh, how to diagnose and uh, you know for uh, mafld also you know we calculate accordingly but here the you know index is taken low as 1.45 and 1.45 to 3.26 and then more than 3.26 now again important thing which we have to understand is once we uh, diagnose we should always grade whether it is mild intermediate or high because according it's like you know doing hb a1c if it is more, more than 9% at the diagnosis either a triple drug or you know insulin treatment so same is here that higher or more severe is the disease more intensive is the treatment so basically for nafld there are three things which we have to diagnose and which we have to target one is lipid metabolism other is fibrosis and other is inflammation so by weight reduction we target every all three but no medicine has all three features so in times to come we will have medications which target lipid separately fibrosis and then inflammation these three important points have to be understood again and there so many studies are already going on and one of them you know our saroglitazar has already been approved by dcgi although it has not yet been approved by fda and there are so many evidences uh, the the trials itself the name is evidences 1 2 3 uh, and 4 and these trials have shown that when you give saroglitazar there is a reduction uh, in sgot pt there is a you know decrease in ballooning as well as you know a decrease in lipid levels inside the liver even we have studies uh, you know which is uh, on biopsy a proven studies in these patients uh, although the number is very small and these are different levels we can see alt sgot pt and you know uh, other uh, say changes in the fat content of the liver uh, by saroglitazar 
So overall, uh, here again, you know, you can see the fat content decreases by almost 30% with saroglitazar. So that point has to be understood well. Now, this is, uh, you know, triglyceride levels decrease uh, total cholesterol, LDL, and uh, increase in HDL. Saroglitazar is a dual, uh, say, alpha and gamma PPR agonist. So it not only has a role in decreasing a lipid or, you know, controlling lipid, also it improves insulin sensitivity like pioglitazone. So it has got a dual uh, action of having a control on hyperglycemia as well as lipid lowering. Then uh, saroglitazar also was found to decrease CK18 like markers of fibrosis. Now, this is a new drug which is already available, uh, obitocolic acid, which is, uh, which is a farsenoid. Uh, receptor, X receptor agonist, FXR agonist. It is an anti-fibrotic and anti-inflammatory agent, which very few of you would be knowing. And this has, you know, it is 100 times more, you know, potent than uh, kinodeoxycholic acid, as well as it regulates the genes which are involved in acid, uh, you know, bile acid metabolism. And it has already been, it is also approved for the treatment of NAFLD NASH and there is a significant, you know, role. So overall guidelines, if we see today, uh, you know, there is basically reduction of weight, uh, but at the same time, you know, uh, less, uh, you know, bariatric surgery can also be undertaken. And uh, like overall, uh, if you, uh, you know, uh, we, we see that NAFLD, that this is my last slide, it affects nearly one third of the general population and two third of the obese and diabetic population, maybe more, maybe more. It is an emerging cause of CLD. It has replaced alcoholic liver disease already in causing cirrhosis. Now the world over, it is basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, NAFLD, which is the cause for uh, chronic liver disease. And it is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. This point has to be understood well. It is an overlooked complication because, sir, uh, it is fatty liver. I was at gone, got an ultrasound, incidental finding, and nothing is done after that. Please, no. Take it seriously. Try to evaluate the patient. Find out. There may be some other cardiovascular risk factors. Treat all multiple risk factors. And weight reduction is most important. Now, early and timely intervention, and in times to come, I think, you know, we would be talking MAFLD, not NAFLD. It will be more easy, you know, for us because clinical diagnosis are always easier and then you know the treatment uh, would be started weight reduction is the only approved treatment as of today saroglitazar is the only which is approved by dcgi but not fda all other molecules like vitamin e vitamin you know even pioglitazone they are these trials have shown but not approved pioglitazone in diabetic patients not in non diabetic patients take my words non diabetic patients only weight reduction diabetic patients yes pioglitazone even metformin and even GLP-1, DPP-4 and SGLT-2 inhibitors also have shown, uh, you know, to reverse uh, NAFLD. So at the same time, uh, don't forget to reduce and take care of all other cardiometabolic uh, risk factors. So basically, uh, today, you know, pharmacotherapy is again, you know, we still are in a, you know, in fancy phase, uh, weight reduction and, uh, you know, uh, management of uh, cardiometabolic risk factors. Yes, in times to come, maybe as I told you, obitocolic acid is also a new drug uh, which can reverse even fibrosis and anti-inflammatory. Uh, so with this, I conclude my talk and I convey my thanks to all of you.